The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is 6046 recitation. Just make sure you're in the right place. Uh, my name is Ling Ren. I'm one of the 10 TAs for this class. <coughs> and we do have a second TA for this section. I think uh, he's not here right now. But uh, basically, Shankan and I will be switching every other week. And I want to remind you, uh, just a heads up, uh, this section is recorded for OCW purpose. But uh, I think he's, also, he's only recording the, uh, us, the TAs. He will, yeah, not, you're, you're not in the camera, OK? All right, so the only purpose uh, we are here is to help you learn this very interesting and also very useful class. So don't hesitate to ask any questions or give us any feedback, like whether I'm going too fast or too slow whether you want us to cover something that's not in the posted schedule, right? or yeah, just any, anything, anything we can help. All right, so let's get started. The two lectures in this week, in the first week, focus on divide and conquer. It is a class of algorithm that usually involves recursion uh, in the algorithm description. And Professor Davidas worked, uh, gone through several uh, algorithms, including weighted interval scheduling and some, a bunch of others. And he left several open problems. So we will answer those open questions in this section. And we'll also uh, show you a new algorithm and analyze a bunch of other algorithms. So just to remind everyone what weighted interval scheduling is, uh, in this problem, we are given a bunch of requests. each with a start time and the finish time. And our goal is to find a subset of them that are compatible, meaning they do not overlap, and uh, that have a largest combined weight. OK, are we clear? Everyone clear about that? So uh, an easier case is when the problem is unweighted, meaning that all you can think of every task has the same weight. In that case, we can just solve it using a greedy algorithm. But when the problem becomes weighted, uh, we have to use dynamic programming or recursion. And Srini uh, introduced a simple one, a basic version uh, in, in a class. Can someone remind us how that algorithm works? Any volunteers? Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak louder? We pick the earliest finish time for the next interval. So we find the next non conflicting interval mm -hmm. that has the earliest finish time. And then we pick that. Uh, so what's your name? Uh, Dr. Sai. Uh -huh. Then again, is that weighted? Then I come to the Yeah, I think uh, the version you described is for the unweighted case. In the unweighted case, we just schedule the earliest, uh, the one with the earliest finish time, and then uh, we remove all the incompatible ones, and we keep going. Right? That solves the unweighted version. If it's the weighted version, we need to use recursion. And remember, uh, we break the problem into many sub-problems, and each one can potentially be an optimal solution. Does anyone remember that? Can you give it a try? Mm -hmm. um, and then we 
calculate that's the problem starting at all the different finish times. Mm -hmm. We find the maximum of that. Great. Uh, what is your name? I mean. Uh, what is your name? Amy. I mean. I mean. OK. I mean, that, uh, let's just try everyone as our potential first request. So if I set, if, I, if we choose request j as our first, we get its weight. Right? And then we're going to solve a subproblem. So let me call the original problem weighted interval scheduling with all the incoming requests. Now we choose j request as our first. Now we are left with a subproblem. Uh, that starts after request j finishes. So I'll write that as rj, where I define rj to be the set of requests where their start time is later than the finish time of the jth request. OK, to re, uh, just to repeat, we choose a request as the potential, potentially the first request. And then we look at all the requests that start after it and solve a subproblem of, uh, of that case. Then we take a max of all the candidates we have. And that's going to give us the optimal solution. Any question about this algorithm? So this algorithm runs in n square time. Now we are going to try to optimize that and come up with a better algorithm. So uh, in order to improve anything, we first want to identify the inefficiency in this algorithm. Right? So which part in the algorithm do you think is inefficient or silly, unnecessary? Go ahead. So it's inefficient to, to look through every previous subproblem uh, when mm -hmm. we're trying to find. So you. Uh, mm -hmm. We're trying to find the maximum score for, for any particular subproblem. Are you saying that we don't need to go through every of this case? Yeah, yeah, we should. Well, we should be able to. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think you are definitely correct. So let me just go through uh, what this algorithm does, and it will be more clear. So what this means is, I'll choose my, I'll choose the first request, uh, request one as my first request. Then I'm going to consider only the request that start after one finishes. Right, that only leaves request five. Potentially some others I didn't draw there. Okay, that's my first candidate in that max. My second candidate is I choose request two as my first request. Then I have to remove request one because it starts too early. And then I'm left with all the remaining requests. I'll solve that subproblem. That's candidate two. Candidate three, I choose request three as my first request. And then I have to remove one and two because they start too early. Oh. <coughs> Four as well. It also starts too early, right? Before three finishes. Everyone following that? So we are left with the remaining request. Okay? Is it more clear now? Go ahead. So, candidate, I mean, if you start with three, that's actually a subproblem of two. So, you see that, like, you're doing a lot of extra work to just turn out. Great point. Uh, so, what's your name? Andrew. Andrew? Andrew said, um, we can potentially be solving many repeated subproblems. Because, right? yeah, we definitely don't want to do that. And that's actually the core idea, the one crisp idea of dynamic programming. Uh, Andrew, can you tell me what's the definition of dynamic programming? You don't remember? Anyone remember that? Go ahead. You can just memorize subproblems and then look them up. Exactly. So dynamic programming uh, says 
we will break a, prob a problem into sub-problems and sub-problem into even more sub-problems. But whenever we solve one, we should memoize or just remember its result and store it somewhere. And if you need it again, we'll just retrieve it right, without resolving the problem. That's definitely a great point. Uh, so we'll, we can analyze this, the complexity of this algorithm uh, later, because I want to touch on this more efficient algorithm first. And we'll see that even after Andrew's optimization, its runtime is n square. So without that observation, if we are solving repeated subproblems, it will be a, a lot worse than that. Want anything to s Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you can also trim ones that like, get to the same place, so you don't need to explore two paths. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, say that again? You don't need to explore two paths that get to like, both explore and free. Once, you're, once they're both looking at free, then you only need to do the one that's more efficient to that point. Mm -hmm. OK, cool. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, uh, your same thing? Or, well, I have another question. I think to, to get better than n square, I think we need to make the observation that it's um, always fine to start a sub problem later. So mm -hmm. if, if you if you've decided you're taking a certain sequence of intervals as your first interval, and then you want to see how to continue from there, um, it it's always valid to start later. Mm -hmm. uh, then um, then maybe you had to. So so that means that. We can, if we can efficiently start at any particular point, query for the maximum um, of any of the subproblems starting after that point. Then mm -hmm. we can okay, great. Work. Yeah, I think uh, we are on the same page. So, <coughs> um, when I describe the steps of this algorithm, remember the first, uh, the third candidate, I choose this as my first, right? It makes zero sense because. If I do that, I might as well put in two as well. Doesn't hurt, right? <coughs> Everyone get that? <coughs> so yeah, the idea is that we shouldn't try every possible uh, w, uh, request as my first. Some requests <coughs> are just better, uh, more suited to be the first request. And how we are going to do that? So apparently, one can potentially be the first request. Two can also be. But it, make, it doesn't make any sense for any request to come after that, because yeah, there is an earlier request. Right? So the efficient algorithm, uh, let's first sort them by their start time. We are going to consider the request that comes early first. <coughs> So I have my entire problem here. Now I'm going to ask a question. Should I include request one in my solution or not? That's only two cases. So if I do not uh, select one in my solution, what subproblem am I left with? Any idea? If I decide I will not include one in my solution. Yeah, exactly. Because <coughs> it does, uh, there's no conflicts anywhere. I'll solve a sub problem from 2 to n. If I do decide to put my request one in the solution, I get its weight. So what's the sub problem I'm left with? In this example, it's five, correct? But more generally, exactly every request that starts after one finishes. Okay. Now suddenly we are not breaking the original problem into n subproblems. We only have two subproblems. So let me draw a recursion tree, which is a, a powerful tool in analyzing these sort of things. So we start with our original problem from 1 to n. 
And we have two subproblems, 2, 2, n, and r1, 2, n. This one will also break them into subproblems. So what is this one? Okay, I'm, I have my subproblem 2, 2, n, and I need to further reply the same trick. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, these are, these are the two cases. Right? Either I schedule, uh, either I do not schedule my first, or I schedule it, and it's my first request. Right? Now here, I'm left with this problem. Either I do not schedule it, or I schedule it as my first request. So what is this one? Three to n, right? Because now I'm asking the same question for two, and here I'll have r two to n, so on and so forth. Now, uh, let me point out the uh, big difference for this version and for the basic version. So I'm starting with the request that starts first. If I do not do that, say if here. I, I'm asking the question for 5. Do I schedule 5 as my first or not? Then what happens? Then these two branches do not cover all the cases, right? Because I can potentially schedule it, but not as my first in the optimal solution. If I'm asking a question for a random request. However, if I start with the first request, uh, first, meaning it starts earliest, it will either be not scheduled or it will be scheduled and as the first, because it cannot be the second request in my solution. Any questions about this algorithm? Okay. Now this is algorithm. Uh, let's analyze its complexity. So what's the overall complexity uh, when we go all the way down, solve the entire original problem? Any guesses? What do you think? What do you think? Go ahead. Uh, it should be uh, n log n, because we're going to need to sort the intervals. Mm -hmm. So, because the first step is sorting, which is lo n log n. <clears throat> now, after I sort everything, uh, the question I need to answer is how many unique subproblems are there right, in this entire recursion tree? So, I'm not going to solve the same problem twice. How many unique problems exist here? n of them, right? just this left branch. Okay? All the others will be one of these. Right? So I can start from bottom, uh, the bottom of the tree and work my way up. And uh, when I say, when I want to go this, take this step, uh, I'll look up the result of this in one of, one of the subproblems I've already solved. Okay? So actually, the recursion itself is only O of n. Questions. Said, what, what is the sorting referring to? OK. So <coughs> we need to uh, start with the request that starts first. Right? We need to decide whether we schedule it or not. And then we need to uh, do the same thing for this request too. It's the start earliest request in this subset. We always need to do that for all the subproblems. <coughs> So the overall complexity is n log n. 
But if we only focus on this recursion step, our improvement is actually larger than that, because it went from n square to uh, O of n. So why is the original algorithm n squared? I think it also has only n unique subproblems, right? So do you agree that the original algorithm is n squared? Or do you think it's also O of n? Just focus on the recursion step. Uh, but assuming I do not do that, assuming whenever I solve it once, I store the result somewhere, and I directly get it. Okay. Assuming I do that, what's the complexity? Go ahead. Uh huh. You think it's all of n? So anyone think it's uh, n squared? Because I think Srini said it's n squared. Okay, go ahead. Exactly right. Yeah. So here, whenever we go up one step, I'm doing constant number of work. Right? I'm just comparing two numbers and do, taking the max. However, in the original algorithm, which is here, whenever I want to go one step up, there are n branches of the tree. So my total amount of work is like 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus n. Right? Every step becomes harder when I go up. And this is n squared. Any questions about that? OK, uh, this is so much for our weighted interval scheduling. Now I'm going to transition to the next topic. So any question? Uh, on this site in general for the scheduling problem. Do you have a question? No? OK. <coughs> yep. Uh, now let's turn to a, se a second topic of this section, which is Strassen algorithm. Strassen algorithm is an uh, efficient algorithm for matrix multiplication. And matrix multiplication is a really useful primitive, <laughs> or it has applications in almost uh, every area. Like I can think of uh, circuit simulation, uh, simulation, climate simulation, and physics, uh, basically everything. Now, uh, I actually had some experience with matrix multiplication, because my undergrad research uh, was improving matrix algorithms. And actually, many matrix algorithms, including like inversion, solving equations, they all use multiplication as a primitive. So it actually comes down to improving matrix multiplication. And I tried very hard to just optimize this basic matrix multiplication. We will take a row, uh, you take a column, and then you get your answer for this spot. And everyone's familiar with that, right? I tried very hard, but it's still 100x slower than the best algorithm out there. So I finally looked it up, and I was completely mind blown when I know that matrix algorithm complexity is not n cubic. It's actually smaller than that. Is this a surprise to you? Anyone expect that before? And uh, the technique? The more efficient algorithm uses is exactly Strassen algorithm. Now that we're talking about divide and conquer, uh, you can guess it must be a divide and conquer algorithm. And so, does anyone have an idea how to divide the original problem? You want to give it give it a try? So, uh, are you familiar with tiled? matrix multiplication or blocked matrix multiplication. OK, uh, can you tell us what that is? Uh, yeah, you can break it into uh, like quadrants, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> okay, cool. So say this is our A and B, and we want C. We can break each matrix into four parts. I'll call this A11, A12, A21, A22, B11, B12, B21, B22. Same thing for C. Now, uh, I would like someone to tell me what is C11 in this case. Go ahead. A12, B21. Yeah. And C12 is just speak up. Don't be shy. Okay, this is also my first section ever in my life teaching a recitation. I'm more nervous than you guys. Mm -hmm. What is C12? A11, B12, A12, B22. So the rule is the same as before, matrix multiplication. Compute this. We take this row, this column, and it gives us this. Right. Thank you. A12, B21, A11. OK. And same thing, C21, we're going to take this row and this column. A21, B11. Plus A22, B21. C22 is A21, B12. Plus A22, B22. OK? And everyone understands this? OK, great. So now we've broken up the original problem into several subproblems. We only need to do matrix multiplication here eight times. And each of this matrix is uh, half in size. Right? If the original algorithm is n cubic, now each subproblem is half n cubic. Then we have eight of them. So the complexity is still n cubic. No improvement at all. So actually, to be more precise, uh, we should, so to know, because we can further break up these matrices into smaller blocks. So to be precise, its re uh, complexity should be given by a recursion, okay. eight subproblems, each one half the size, plus, can anyone, anyone tell me? What's the merging complexity once I get uh, all this. All the go ahead. Just constant because you're adding or uh, yeah, because I'm adding, but is it constant? I'm adding these two matrices. For the base case or for each level. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Oh, for, each, for each level if you're base case. Uh, yeah, for base cases, of course, constant. Okay. So okay, so maybe I'm not clear about this. What's what's the subproblem in this case? It's this multiplication operation, okay? And so these are the eight subproblems I will solve. After solving them, I need to add them together. And adding two matrices, and each is size half of n. The complexity is yeah, it's n square. Basically, n squared. So, to get a precise uh, complexity, we should solve this recursion, but it will end up being the same thing as uh, this intuition, n cubic. Okay, so now this is the magic. So, Strassen in 1969 came up with this algorithm. And 
uh, each of these is a two n, a half n by half n matrix. Okay. 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 Cool. So Strassen came up with this algorithm. He somehow defined m1 through m7 seven matrices in this way. I can't provide any intuition because I didn't come up with this. And somehow, with those seven matrices, he can reconstruct, he can compute all the four uh, sub-matrices in C. And it's not very inter interesting to check it because the algorithm is definitely correct. Uh, but let's just do one of them. OK, how about this one? So C21 is M2 plus M4. It's M2 plus M4. So M2 have uh, A12, B11, A22, B, B11. So there's M4, there's A22 minus B11. So that cancels out. Right? So it, we are left with A21, B11 plus A22, B21. That's the correct answer. So this is a, I guess it's a very clever algorithm. You have to work in that area for 10 years to come up with this. So that's not our concern. Our goal is to analyze this algorithm. What's the complexity of it? So does anyone understand this recursion? Can someone tell me what's the recursion for this part, for this uh, Strassen algorithm? We have the original problem. And we have some, go ahead. So since each of the like, n1 through 7 only require one multiplication, mm -hmm. um, we only need to solve 7 subproblems, so 7t, n over 2, 1, so n squared, n over 4. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Everyone gets this? So what Strassen did is it, he came up with the seven matrices. Each one requires only one multiplication. So we have seven subproblems instead of eight. And that's going to give us a benefit, an, improve, an improvement. Now, so the question now becomes, how do I solve this recursion? Right? Given this recursion, how do I know its complexity? And same question there. Anyone want to give it a try? So that's going to uh, be covered in the third topic. What can I erase? Which is master theorem. So master theorem does exactly that. All it does is given the recursion A and T of M over B plus some work for merging where A and B are constants, it directly tells you what Tn is in some cases. So I'll first write the formula. Uh, master theorem has actually has three cases. The first case is Fn is order n raised to c, where c is less than log b of a. Then master theorem says its complexity is theta log b of a. Second case, Fn is theta then c log k, where c is log b of equal to b of a, then its com complexity is n raised to c log k plus 1. Then. You don't necessarily have to copy them, because uh, you can just find, them and find it anywhere. And the third case, you can imagine, is the other uh, 
the only remaining case, which is fn is large, is omega, n raised to c, where c is greater than log b of a. Then master theorem says its complexity of uh, the complexity of tn is theta fn. So intuitively, if fn is not too much work, then it's basically this recursion, what recursion gives you. If fn dominates, fn is the uh, biggest component, then tn is roughly on the order of fn. And there's a case in the middle. Now let's uh, see why that is the case. Uh, I'll only cover one case here. So again, we are going to draw a recursion tree, because that is very useful in all the recursion problems. So we start with the problem of size n. And we break them into problem size n over b. So on and so forth. And um, what's the size of this, this subproblem? Okay. So that recursion represents a class of recursive algorithm. Every time it breaks the problem, uh, it reduces the problem size by a factor of b. So what do I have here? Go ahead. n over b squared. So on and so forth. So what is a in this graph? Go ahead. Three? Think so? Three. Right. A is just a branching factor of this tree. Right. I keep going. Finally, I will reach my base case. So my next question is, after how many levels of recursion will I reach a base case of size 1? Go ahead. Log b of log b of okay. So because here is n over b, n over b square. Next one, n over b cubic, so on and so forth. So for the say this last level is teeth level, then the problem size is n over b raised to t. And we want that to be a constant. So what is t? Log b of n. Now this is the recursion tree. And we have that fn amount of merging work to do. So here we have to do fn work right, to merge these a results to uh, the, the solution of our problem n. And we have f, what's the merging work for this level, for this part of the tree? This is my problem size. n over b. Right, and we have a of them. OK? So, so on and so forth. So then we can, we know what is Tn. Let's just enumerate all the work we have to do. So on the first level, we have to do Fn. OK, on the second level, A, F, N of B, oh, sorry, N over B. And what's the next level? <coughs> we have how many subproblems? Speak louder. A square subproblems, and each of them is n over b squared. And finally, I reach my last level. They are all base cases. So I have a raised to t of them, right? because I define t to be my depth of the tree. And each of them is t of 1. 
Okay, so that's Tn. I'm not entirely happy with this formula because I have this beautiful pattern here, right? Except for that last guy. It's a uh, add one a and divide one b, blah blah blah. So I'm going to change this t into f. Can I do that? Because it's entirely it's the same, right? T1 is a constant, F1 is also a constant. Then I get my beautiful form where it's a sum from i equals 0 to t. What's, the, what's in the sum? Go ahead. A raised to i. F n over d i. Everyone gets that? Now uh, you can roughly see why we have three cases. So uh, let me deal with the first case. The first case says F n is all the <coughs> n raised to c. Right? What does that mean? It means this guy here is sigma a raised to n, then this is what's in my f raised to c. Okay? There should be an order here, but everything has an order before it. Right? So I just omit that. So it actually should be this. Okay? So this, because n raised to c is actually independent of this sum, I can pull it out. And what am I left with? Is that correct? Now this is a sum of geometric sequence. Right? We know how to solve that. Right? Uh, but we need to check whether this ratio is greater or larger than 1, or if it's equal to 1. And what is this ratio? The case tells us. Right? So C is less than log b of a. That means if I b raised to c is less than b raised to this guy, which is a. Right? So we know our denominator is greater than our, uh, is smaller than our numerator. So this is a, it's an increasing sequence. Right? So what we have is n raised to c, then that thing raised to t minus 1 divided by this, this thing minus 1, but they are all constants. Right? Are everyone familiar with the, this formula of ge geometric sequence? OK. So that's what we have. Next, we have t equals log b of n. That means b raised to t is n, correct? So then b raised to t is n, then we have raised to c, cancel them, can, they cancel out. What do we have? I want to make sure everyone is following. Mm -hmm. A raised to t. No questions? OK, let me do that again. Uh, OK, I'll, it's actually a raised to t. And then n over bt raised to c, right? How did you get from the line above that? This one to here? Yeah. Oh, it's the uh, sum of geometric sequence. So if I have 1 plus q plus q squared plus all the way to qt, it's q t plus 1, I guess or t, I don't remember very well, minus 1, then q minus 1. OK? I guess this should be t plus 1, right? OK, so this is what we were doing. So this is our q minus 1, and divided by q minus 1, they are all constants, so I don't care about them. So a raised to, a raised to t plus this thing raised to c, but we said that b raised, b raised to t is equal to n. So we're just left with a raised to t. And 
what is t? t is log b of n. I can write it as log a of n over log a of b. Are you familiar with that? That means log a of n, log b of a. Okay, this one I flipped them, so it. Uh, <coughs> so this, what is that? That is n. Okay, well done. Are we? Uh, not exactly, because I have an order here, right? So everything is order. If you only care about order, a big O, then it's fine. But that theorem says theta. So you have to prove it the other way, that it's no less than that. Okay? But I'm not going to do that. It's not, it's not very hard. Uh, next, I'm going to apply this theorem to the two um, problems we left here. So let's apply master theorem to this recurrence. I think you are still looking at that side. So what is the A, B, C for, for this? A is 8, B is 2. Right? And C is 2. Log B of A is 3. So that's the which case of the master theorem? OK, so the theorem says it should be n raised to log B of A, which is 3. OK? Now, what we have here? Can I invite someone to do that for me? Want to give it a try? Yeah, go ahead. OK, so we have a equals 7, b equals 2, and c equals 2, like before. Um, and now we want to see whether uh, c equals 2 is, is less than uh, log b of a, which is log 2 of 7. Uh, and pretty sure that's still the case. So mm -hmm. we should just get n to the log 2 of 7. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, log 2 of, yeah, thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. So log 2 of 7 uh, is definitely greater than 2. Why? Because log 2 of 4 is 2, right? So this happens to be n raised to 2.80 and many other digits, but it's less than n cubic. And uh, just for knowledge purpose, this is no longer the best. It, it, it was the best when it was proposed. And well. Researchers in that area has got, got it down to n raised to 2.35, I think 2.37 first, then 2.35. I'm not following the literature very closely, so maybe it's 2.34 now. OK, so I should have one more thing to uh, cover, but I think we are running out of time. Sorry about that. Uh, I can post. Uh, so the last thing we, we should do is remember we have this median finding algorithm where we have a recurrence, uh, which is I think n over 5 with some seeding, and then plus uh, this, right? And plus some theta n. And uh, we want to solve this recursion. But we cannot apply master theorem, right? Apparently, it's not the right form. So, we have to, so when master theorem doesn't apply, we have to study it case by case. Now let me see if I have time to do that. Okay, I think I probably do. So uh, to solve that case, 
First, can someone tell me what's the definition of theta? We have to go back to the definition to solve that. What does theta mean, even mean? So if I say fn is theta n, what do I really mean? Go ahead. Uh, it's tightly bounded, so both are moving to go either side. Great. So it means I can find some k1 and k2 such that this holds when n gets uh, sufficiently large. OK? So now we're going to do an induction. Assuming for all the small n less than capital N, uh, my Tn is bounded by this k2 and k1 thing. Okay, Then uh, my next step is T of this capital N would be bounded. Uh, I'll do the left right side first. Will be bounded by k2 and 5 seating plus k2. Like things in that uh, in the second term, and plus another theta n. So we know that means it's bounded by some other number. I'll say a2 n. Okay, that's the definition of theta n. Then can I find, uh, I want this to be, sorry, all of them should be capital N, capital N, capital N. I want this to be smaller than k2, capital N. Right? Because this, uh, so let me redo this first step. This is roughly 5 of k2 plus 7 over 10 k2 and plus a2 of n plus a bunch of constants that I don't care. I want it to be smaller than k2 of n. Can I reach that? Of course I can, right? If I select k2, to be greater than all we have here, right, what is this? This is 9 over 10n, 9 over 10k2 plus a2, right? So if I select k2 to be greater than 10 times a2, is everyone following that? When n is sufficiently large, tn should be bounded by k2n, right? That's my, uh, that's the induction. I am assuming when n is smaller than capital N, I have solved them, so I can use these two, and I saw the next step. So there's the other side, which is very similar. I'm not going to go through that. All right, so uh, that's all for today. And just to quickly recap, we went through uh, the weighted in scheduling weighted interval scheduling and the Strassen algorithm master theorem and applying master theorem and that a case study of a new recursion okay and thanks everyone for coming